students here currently, and I get the privilege and honor to introduce a speaker for today. Roger um, is a faculty member here at school. Um, he's a licensed married family therapist at um, a clinic in Woodbury. And he has, um, he, he has done his um, BA at the University of Maine, as well as his Master's of Ed at the College of William and Mary. And when he was out in Maine, he had the privilege of working with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. So he's really big into symphony music. He has uh, mastered the timpani and... No, we'd say master, no. Oh, <laughs> it's not master. That, that's good. Um, and one other instrument. Oh, the percussion. Um, and he's also an avid Red Sox fan. So Yay. if you're a big baseball fan, that, that will really touch his heartstrings if you really get in a conversation with him along with percussion. Um, he's going to be talking about parenting today in this session and the role of parenting within the Adler um, structure. So with no further ado, Roger Ballou. Thank you, Ken. This is Ken Becker. <laughs> Ken Becker, yes, I, I was wondering, I'd ask him, do you, you say your name? <laughs> so enjoy the workshop, folks. Well, you're kind of spread out, and uh, my prediction is there'll be more people coming in, so that's good. We've got a place in here they can filter in, and I'll try to do a, a, a fairly good job of talking to you and welcoming them simultaneously, anybody else who shows up later. Um, my impulse would be to not do anything until every one of us had a chance to introduce ourselves and tell us about yourselves and so forth and so on, but time probably doesn't allow for that. So I'm going to forego it. We're going to go till 10.15. Um, I'm probably going to have you stretch and stand. It's not going to be constant what I'm going to be doing. Um, Teresa is taping this, am I right? It's being taped, okay. So I'm supposed to stand in a fairly contained area. So if I go way over there or way over here, it's not good for you. It's fine. You can move wherever you want. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, most of you, um, by the way, welcome. Glad you're, this is a, an adventure by the Adler Graduate School to have what we call the Master's Weekend. And uh, some of the presenters are actually sitting in the room. One of our uh, most eminent guests who came up from Chicago is Dr. Harold Mozak, who's sitting right here. And he's going to be the uh, premier presenter for this afternoon, doing a kind of a workshop. Uh, Mim Pugh is sitting over here. She's going to be doing a uh, sort of hosting tomorrow's luncheon. Is that right? You're going to be um, speaking Hi. that. Any other presenters in here? I see. I'm not sure. There are some people who are faculty members here um, with the Outer Graduate School here in Minnesota. Tina Feigl is right here. She's sitting. She's a faculty member. Um, I think that's kind of it on the faculty members. Then a number of students are interspersed, and of course I'd be very curious to know. Some of you who I, I don't recognize, for example, how did, how did you get here today, for example? Oh, hi. I, there he is. That's a little bit. You are? John. John. You're connected to? Okay. There's somebody I didn't know, and we figured out how you got. How He's a psychologist. And you're a psychologist. Okay. Well, good. Wonderful. Let me see. Who else do I not recognize? Margaret. I don't recognize you, so how did you come today? Well, Adler the Adler Institute. She's saying she's a, a graduate. Yeah. Okay. And um, I'm at this program because I'm parenting again. I she's lived with a nine-year-old. Oh and my gosh. I'm a care, okay. Caregiver since the day she was born. Oh wow. And, okay. um, boy, boy, I've made as many mistakes with her as I did with the first. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Uh, yes. Yeah. And someone left a message on my phone that this was happening, so <laughs> okay. I called up Evelyn and I'm here. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, good. Well, there we go. It's kind of a, very much a mix. And uh, many of you I know, too, are practitioners. You're licensed. You're out there in the field. And um, so I am not here to be an expert. I'm here because the Student Association said, would you give a talk about parenting? I'm a parent, um, and I said, well, sure, you know, and um, the story for me is something like this. Um, my introduction to Adler occurred um, when I was, well, never places during my graduate work, um, 
as Ken said, my, my master's degree is from the College of William Mary in Virginia, and my doctorate's from Purdue University. And of course, I took courses in personality and um, psychotherapy that touched on Adlerian theory. Um, but it wasn't until coming to Minnesota in about 19, I guess about 98, I became associated with the Abbott Graduate School. And at the same time, somebody at one point said, I don't know where it really was, but somebody said, would you come to our, it was a church, and on a Sunday morning to a group of parents give a talk about parenting. And um, I'm one of these people who, um, like many of you, if you get an opportunity to, if somebody invites you to come and give a talk about something, you say yes. It doesn't really matter whether you know anything about it. You, just, <laughs> you say yes, and then you start researching it, and you figure that you'll know more when the time of the talk occurs than your audience will, so you'll seem you know, relatively um, informed. So I went to this church, I think it was First Presbyterian in Stillwater, actually, and I did this talk, and one thing led to another. And pretty soon I started doing these classes. Um, well, they were spin-offs, really. What I was doing was kind of a spin-off between the, the, the full uh, Chorn of the Challenge series, as one would have done it probably in 1969 or 1975, and my own conscientiousness about the modern American family just not willing to commit that kind of time. So I was trying to take the things I thought were the cornerstones, if you will, and that's what I'll talk about today, and incorporate these, and then really say to the parents, if you want to know more, this is how you can do that. And um, so this has kind of mushroomed. I, I, I'm doing these fairly right now in Woodbury, Stillwater, River Falls, Hudson, more up on the East Metro, which is where the clinical practice I'm associated with is. In fact, coming up in two weeks, I start another one called Rape. I call the program I do for, this, for parents of younger children Raising Kids Who Can. That's actually using a banner that a woman out in Pennsylvania, some of you know her, Betty Lou Bettner, uh, has used that as a title for one of her books and one of her uh, parenting series. It's a, it has a nice ring to it, so I put on the uh, chairs in front of you, uh, not many, but I put some flyers of a program I'm starting in two weeks at the River Falls Area Hospital, Raising Kids Who Can. And this is how it looks um, in terms of what I do for the parents of the smaller children. I also do a program called Parenting Teens. And that's aimed, of course, at parents of teenagers. Welcome, just come in and have a seat. Just make yourself comfortable. And I think there'll be handouts enough on the chairs. That I can see them out over in this area. So. It's interesting to do, the way I do these is, first of all, it's not in a theater style like this. I, I, I always, the room is always organized into a large circle. And typically for these programs, there'll be 20, 22 parents. Now, variations, though, there are you know, classically many uh, two-parent couples there, but you get many single parents. Um, you get grandparents who are now parenting again. You get people working in daycare type places who are sent by their staff to kind of learn some parent, learn some skills in terms of working with children. And I sit them in a circle. When you do the parenting younger children, the raising kids who can, I find it's a very um, attentive group. They're kind of bright-eyed. When you do parenting teens, it's much more somber. <laughs> they, uh, they enter the room and they kind of you know, have a look about them. And um, oh boy, you know, it, they're, they're, they're much more ready for this kind of, you know, for some kind of information to help them along. Um, what I incorporate in these programs is um, much of the work of Michael, uh, only Michael Popkin, who you're going to see today, who has a um, a group out of Marietta, Georgia called Active Parenting, or it's really on the web, it's called Active Parenting Publishers, and I'll, I'll show you some of that as well. Um, but because many of you know some of the parenting literature, I want to go back and really begin this presentation to you kind of way back in time, like go back about 300,000 years. So um, now when I do classes here, of course the students who are in here, or people in here who have been students with me, know we do this all the time, is I ask people to read. Well, on your chair, I think there were enough to go around, was a sheet about homo sapiens. So I think it'd be useful for the sake of this one hour presentation to take us back and who are we? You know, look at us here, these living organisms, but who are we? So. Um, I seek a volunteer who would be willing to read us through this sheet called the Homo Sapien. We're going to start from the beginning. Not from the dawn of time, but from the dawn, from the dawn of humankind. Would you be willing to read it? Stand and, and read aloud. That'd be nice. Thank you, Meryl, very much. Homo Sapiens, the modern, the modern human is the only living species in the Homo genus. 
Homo sapiens are characterized by bipedal posture, excellent eyesight, and a very large brain that allows for innovative thought and problem-solving capabilities. The head of a Homo sapien is larger than other primates because the skull is larger than other primates because the skull needs room to enclose this large brain. Humans also have a highly developed nervous system and strong senses. Especially important is the depth perception, stereoscopic vision, made possible because their eyes are located near each other. <laughs> Um, like other apes, humans have the opposing thumbs and the nails on their fingers, but they lack tails. The upper legs of the human have very strong muscles, allowing it to stand upright. A curve in the spine near the lower back also allows an upright posture because the center of gravity of a human is directly over the pelvis. Humans probably evolved from Australopithecus. <coughs> Afarensis, because this was the first species to stand upright. Very, very good. I just, we all watched you get that word in. <laughs> <laughs> However, Afarensis did not have a large brain comparable to the brain of a human. This species died out by about 1.4 million years ago, but probably gave rise to Homo genus. genus. The first species of this genus was Homo habilis first seen about 2.5 million years ago. This species was upright and had a much larger brain than Afarensis. Homo habilis was probably able to use simple tools and lived in a hunting and gathering lifestyle. This species gave rise to Homo erectus, upright position, first seen 1.8 million years ago. These people were larger than Homo habilis and is that the yeah. Okay. Perfect. And had an even larger brain. They were even able to develop some civilization, living in groups and making permanent uh, settlements. Homo erectus died out about 250,000 years ago, but not before giving rise to our species, Homo sapiens. Humans were first seen 300,000 years ago. Homo sapiens had thicker, bones, a larger brain, and pronounced brow ridges. While some scientists believe that this species originated in Africa, others pose that simultaneous evolution in many places created a species that developed in many places at once. The oldest fossils of modern Homo sapiens were dated to 100,000 years ago, a period when Homo sapiens first covered the old world. Though these Homo sapiens were hunter-gatherers and scavengers. However, about 5,000 years ago, farming was begun and people were able to settle down, raise crops, and domesticate animals. Once humans were settled, civilization took hold, first in Mesopotamia and soon in Egypt and elsewhere. Evolution has continued and tools have improved but the people today are fundamentally similar to the Homo sapiens throughout time, as a reference. But I also have to add that in the, uh, um, the uh, Sadler in this river valley, there is in red, there's seen little signs of even really older civilizations yeah. also. So, anyway. Very good, thank you so, very much, great, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Well, here we are. This is kind of our, our story as an evolving species. And what does that have to do with parenting on September 28, 2007? Well, it has a lot to do with it, and it's where I underlined that one sentence, which leads me to this book. Has anybody ever read Ishmael? Well, this is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, Ishmael is a gorilla. He's a large old gorilla. He's enormous. I mean thousands of pounds or thousand pounds. I don't know what big gorillas weigh, but Ishmael's very much a big gorilla. Daniel Quinn has written a number of books like this, but this is the one book that really put Quinn on the map, Ishmael. Um, what Ishmael is is a very wise gorilla who wants to tell the story. And what I mean by that is um, he's looking for a young writer to whom he can tell the story of the evolution of the human species from the gorilla's perspective. 
he wants it to be told. So um, this young writer responds to a advertisement. You get the picture, it might be in one of the New York used newspapers, it says, um, teacher seeking pupil. That's it. And so the young writer finds his way to this old warehouse in New York City or Chicago, wherever it supposedly took place, finds his way into the inner chambers of this old building, and there's, he, he meets Ishmael. Now what Quinn does, and you never really figure it out, is somehow they begin to be able to communicate, uh, whether it's telepathic or through some kind of a language. But anyway, they start to get to know each other, and the writer comes and visits Ishmael day after day after day and records Ishmael's teachings about, about, about the evolution of the earth, the evolution of the human species, its association with the natural world, um, how the interface took place, and so on. And um, it's, it's mostly through questioning. It's a beautiful book to read if one is a teacher because Ishmael constantly asks the young writer questions. It's all through questioning him. And the writer would sometimes have to go out and find these answers and come back and tell Ishmael. Um, I won't tell you how the book ends, but... Um, well, the interesting thing, what Ishmael starts to tell the young writer is much of what you just heard, <coughs> that Merrill just read, goes something like this. For if, if the human, if the Homo sapiens sapien, if you will, has been around for 130,000 years or something like that, for the first 110,000 years, we lived as they lived. We lived as a species on the earth. We were hunter-gatherers. We shared the land. We left things as we found them. In fact, Ishmael starts talking about humans as the leavers and the takers. And he's, he's, he's making the case that uh, many fewer people as we get more prolific, or as we become more exploded as a population, are, we're takers. We don't leave the earth as we found it. We take something away from it when we leave. And so the more takers there are, um, the more the earth suffers. That's one of Ishmael's points. But here we've had this long history back here, all the way through, where we lived as a species of hunters and gatherers. And we lived in balance with the rest of the natural world. We ate, for example, we foraged what we ate. We didn't um, overproduce. And suddenly something happened. Ishmael's very curious about it. He really can't explain it, but he, he, he communicates a lot with the writer about it. Right about here, he says, you human beings made an interesting decision, and that is that you could own land. That changed everything. Who ever thought until you thought that? And no species had ever said, we own land. They would take land and hunt it, and, and, and sort of look at it as territory, but it wasn't that they owned the land. It was, the, it was for example, the game that inhabited the land. And then they'd move on, as hunter-gatherer tribes did. So you made this decision right here. And what started to happen, he, he talks about how it really began over in the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley um, area. And suddenly these people were staking out territory and creating what are now we call farms. And you started to do something, Ishmael says, that changed the balance. And that is you started to produce more food per little plot than there were people on that plot who could consume it. So then you could use it for barter. And when you did that, you caused an enormous population explosion because many, many, many people then could live without being the producers of goods off the land. They could barter for it and do other things. And consequently, starting about here, you caused an enormous population explosion that threw the whole natural world out of balance. And so what Ishmael is telling the writer about, he's telling the writer about this part of the story and also about this part of the story, but here, something changed too, and that is the family went from this kind of hunter-gatherer um, mode into a mini bureaucracy, because this is how the farms were run. The farms are organized around a unit, the family unit. And in as, in as much as they became little bureaucracies, somebody was in charge. Somebody started telling somebody else what to do. And children became worker bees on these farms. Well, that established itself as a way of being in the world for the human being that, that went on for thousands of years. But then again, something changed, and it's right about here. I wrote 1860. What happened about that time, starting about that time? The Industrial Revolution begins. Now something else begins to happen. Children move out of the farm unit and start working in independent industries. They go to work. They're, they're, they're made labor. Uh, I grew up in the Boston area and up in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is up in kind of in the 
northwest corner of the Boston area. There are, that's where a lot of clothing production took place back in the late 19th century, and there were these enormous warehouses, they're warehouses now, but they were factories then, and children by the droves worked in them. Of course, the conditions under which children worked many times were uh, you know, very poor, and we had a lot of sick children, but what's beginning to happen now is the system of administering people stays the same, but people move out from <coughs> the family unit. They're starting to work in other places outside, especially children being labor outside the home. And then we hit something else, and it's right about here. 1960, 100 years later. Boy, talk about a compression in time. What starts to happen about in 1960? The technological age is born. Somebody might say it was the space race that launched it, you know, the, the Soviets. Uh, there was great worry in this country that the Soviets would get ahead of us and they'd be on the moon before we would be and so forth. So now we have another phenomenon occurring. Now, uh, when I was in elementary school, if, uh, if a teacher had stopped us in the, in the sixth grade and said, okay class, if you know more about technology than your parents, raise your hand. <laughs> and every kid in the room would have sat there with a the hand down. And I do this with, um, you, you know, I've taught undergraduate classes, and now in the modern world, if you say, okay students, if you know more about technology than your parents, raise your hand. And every kid in the room will raise his or her hand. And you can do that with third graders now, fifth graders. They'll all put their hand up. Their parents are coming to them constantly for information about how to operate the new Mac, you know, it's just like a, a so, or the iPhone, she says, yeah. So we have this, we have this, so we have this enormous change taking place, and people are not responding to each other, and of course, as people get older, and these become generations carrying on through time, people are less and less willing to live under this sort of agrarian idea of how to be in the world. And that is that people will tell you what to do and you do it. Now we have a lot of organizations that still are more or less organized around that idea, but they're changing, like the military complex, you know, it's, it is changing. Uh, they're trying to adapt. People are responding uh, on the battlefield quite like they used to. Um, we have people coming along, some of, some of you know the work of Edward Deming, for example, does the word name Deming mean anything? He was a kind of a sociologist, industrialist who, um, back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, um, he had kind of these novel ideas about how to organize people in production. And Deming um, was writing, the Americans didn't listen very much. They still liked that bureaucratic model. They liked that idea of, let me, let me have my subordinates and I'll tell them what to do. Deming um, actually started consulting with the Japanese um, Japanese auto industry is one of the places he started consulting, and at that time you had companies like Datsun. Remember Datsun? Um, well, the American car manufacturer has been trying to catch up with the Japanese ever since Deming, uh, Deming's work, really. He started programs like, well, he didn't particularly, but the, the, his work, his philosophy, launched programs like Total Quality Management. You might remember that work. More and more employees become part of decision making and more they have more authority on the line. They're more responsible for their product. They're not waiting around for some boss to tell them what to do all the time. So this whole model's been changing. Well, industry's changing and um, uh, the military is changing. But what are some of the what is one of the last great units to change? The family. People still have this idea that like they did back here they can tell people what to do and they'll do it. And how many parents today in the metropolitan area of Minnesota, St. Paul, will say to their kid, do it because I said so. <laughs> I mean, that's, the, you know, it's such a modern kind, kind of curve response. It has been for a long time. And back here, kids would say, okay. And up here, what do they say? Now why? Make me. <laughs> or why would kids say okay? Like back in the day. What's changed? Because kids are still kids. <laughs> well, I think that the theory of the, the, the whole philosophy of how people relate to one another has changed dramatically. There, um, as, as we're, we're going to hear directors talk about it, people are less willing to submit. And if you look at the history of all of this moving forward, and this is what Ishmael's talking about, people are less willing to submit. They don't want to be, there's not an assumption that just because you tell me what to do, you know what's right for me. Is that because kids have been exposed to society that allows them to do that? Or I mean, are you, are you positive? It's probably a gestalt. Things? It's probably everything at once moving on everything at once. There probably is no one explanation for the question you asked. 
That would be my, uh, my opinion. Well, of course, we know that about, where are we here? About here, at least one person began to see this and, and could see the movement of this in the family unit. Um, so, pattern is built up in the first four or five years. What can we find is reasons for it in perfect organs, or that the child had been pampered, or that we find hated children is among orphans, sometimes illegitimate children, ugly children, not wanted children, and so on. This pattern is fixed and can be changed only if we are able to convince this child about the mistakes for later in life. Therefore, we could eliminate the mistakes in this pattern either in prevention, to educate the family, how to educate children rightly, or we could make the school an instrument of the social progress to recognize the mistakes in their beginning and to accomplish more social interest among the pupils. Later in life it is more difficult and it must be an individual treatment. How to convince such a person and how to change him. In this way we are sure that the key of the individual psychology is the most important and worthwhile key and we can guess much better is with other methods what is the mistake made in the childhood and how to correct it. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I come to the following conclusion. I discovered 20 years ago the inferiority complex which has been proved to be a very worthwhile key for understanding human nature and personalities. As I have explained, an individual is a unity from beginning of life, and his style of life cannot be changed without understanding the mistakes made in the roots. And these roots are lying in the family life in which each individual is formed and molded. So we can find that his great striving to overcome the difficulties of life, his striving going on from a feeling of inferiority and leading towards the goal of superiority is always combined with a certain individual degree of social interest. We find in each expression, in each movement of each individual, how he has used his training for social interest, and so when he meets later in life, the problems which can be solved rightly only if they are really solved in a great social feeling, then it will be decided if he is adjusted rightly or not. So we find at last that all the failures in life, problem children, neurotic and psychotic persons, delinquents, suicides, drunkards, and so on, are always lacking social interest. And it is not only this interest, but in the same way they are also lacking courage, understanding and the right training for the solution of the social problems. Thank you, Dr. Um, by the way, if you looked up here, you might have noticed this doll. This is Jacob. Jacob comes to just about every introduction to a Larian psychology class. We have Jacob come with us to remind us of 
who we're really talking about here. You know, where the, where's the beginning of all this? And probably it predates Jacob's age. I don't know, how old is Jacob? Six months? Got about a six month old baby. Jacob doesn't talk, so I can't tell. But uh, that's why Jacob's here. And it was Ken Becker who said, are you gonna bring Jacob this morning? And I said, oh, I will, okay, I'll bring Jacob. <laughs> so he, he comes to each class. Uh, if you noticed in, in front of you, I put this common concerns expressed by parents regarding the behavior of their younger children. Uh, if you need some extras, I've got them up here. But uh, every one of these parenting classes I do, I'll do it two weeks from Monday night in River Falls. I call the parents and I have them write these things down. I say, what are the problems that you tend to have most with your young children? And this is the list, and I and I, I update it as I need to, but it's so consistent. It varies very little. Now, when I go through this list of parenting concerns, these are young kids and how the parents are viewing uh, the challenges. Tell me when you when I get to the end of this list, what themes you heard. Okay, these are the areas of child behavior that seem to most challenge parents of children ages two through eleven. Morning and evening wake up and bedtime routines. Dressing and undressing, eating, teeth brushing, constant repeating instructions and requests to younger children. Children ignoring parents' instructions and requests. Now this is from the parents. They've been giving me this over years of asking. Uh, children talking back to their parents, sassing them. Children taking advantage of parents when parents are occupied with another task. Children constantly wanting to renegotiate choices given by parents. Defiant children. No, I won't. Sibling rivalry, arguing, <coughs> fighting, complaining to parents. Children's lack of impulse control. Children not cleaning up after themselves. I don't know if that's about 10 or 12, but what are some themes you hear? Control. control. What do you hear? You hear control. You hear submission. What else do you hear? Power. You hear power. Rebellion. You hear rebellion. Defiance. You hear defiance. Seeking independence. You hear independence. So. Maybe it's children with not much social interest in their family organization. Yeah, how, what would you call that? He said, he's saying Why not much interest in the family as an organization, not much social interest. What would you call that? Well, Narcissism. Immature. Narcissism, oh, she's saying. Oh, <laughs> It's a hard label to put on a two-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> um, if yeah, she's saying they are. So uh, you're saying kind of a social interest, kind of a sense of the family. Well, the, the children are very. very I'm, I'm going to ask him to clarify. You're on a, you're on a the theme. The children are very focused on their own thing and their own. They want their video games. And they don't take into. They don't appear to me to take into account the fact that mom is busy with the two-year-old. They want their stuff. Let's call it lack of social awareness. Yeah. Or self-interest. Well, self caring about the family as a well, system. Parents haven't explained how a family works. Okay, and one more comment. You said parents don't have really explained they to children how a family works. How a family gets through life and yeah. works and sets things up and there's reciprocity. Parents don't do that for the children. Almost. She's saying the non-Adlerian parents don't do it. <laughs> well, maybe it's not so obvious because the parents aren't out in the field, they're not cooking, they're not having nine kids, so the little kids don't get to see a family operating as you dad disappear, as you want to disappear, and they hang around and hire help. One more comment, yes. I think the parent and child gap has become this, then they are equaling with their children rather than being a social guidance. You have not even authority, but guidance. So it becomes, and the ch children take on the I, I, me, me, give me, give me, give me, take me, take me, take me, kind there's, of syndrome. There's a, there's a theme in what you just said that you, in one of his last work, work strikers wrote about, that, that the playing field has sort of been leveled in a way, that this assumed power that parents have over, over children, that game has changed. Children have a lot of power to change, to manipulate, and so forth. But, well, yeah, you're, you're onto a whole series of themes which, um, you know, certainly, wouldn't it have been nice if things hadn't changed and the, the mindset of the paradigm of parenting 5,000 years ago were true today and you would just say to your children, go to bed. 
And they would say, oh, okay. <laughs> and I'll brush my teeth and I'll clean up on the way. You know? And then you would just, you know, go open your book again and sit and start reading. And the children, you'd be very quiet within 20 minutes. You know? I wouldn't like it because then you know, the society would be that I would have to submit to the overboard. And oh. I don't want to do that. Oh, okay. You don't want to do that either. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Well, what's happening here is, um, as you can see, is what Adler, I think, clearly recognized was the social milieu was changing. The paradigm of people working with people was changing dramatically. And um, uh, that what, what really was coming to be more the, the, the forefront of people's interaction was notions of cooperation, about making assumptions about people in groups. People seeing that as they serve a group, it's good for themselves as well as the other. And um, so it's kind of a paradigm shift. So in running parent education groups, um, I do this to introduce, and I'll be doing this in two weeks. And a lot of parents will sit there and go, I never thought of that. Now, we have thought of that. I mean, that's a big part of the training here, I think, is to see this newer paradigm. Things are accelerating very fast here. Um, you know, if you look at how in this long span of time, and just in this short time, how much change, and then just in the last 100 years and now, in the last 40 or 50 years, it's accelerating at a tremendously rapid rate. So we as parents really have to catch up. I mean, we really have to catch up. Here are, and I'll pass these around, um, what I consider, I consider, you can, you can, um, these are the cornerstones of Adlerian parenting. Now this is me having been a clinician for a number of years and <coughs> having been a university dean of students before then. And um, we just pass those back. And I'm going to run through them quickly and then um, we'll do some kind of interplay. But when it comes to training the modern, the modern parent, I was about to say the modern American parent, there are some cultural nuances here that are very strong. So when you're running a parented group in um, a community that's a little bit more close in from the metro, if you will, you'll get some diversity of opinion about some of these. There are certainly um, places by culture or religion or ethnicity where the idea of telling children to submit um, is still operative though changing. And uh, one thing, one interesting study is to look at the Hmong who come to the Twin Cities area over the last 40 or 50 years and the tremendous dynamic that's gone on in the changing of that way of parenting. Uh, these children, the first generations of Hmong kids were very responsive to their parents in terms of telling them what to do. Um, but as they were Americanized, the, ki the kids were becoming less and less willing to do that. So there was a period, I think we're sort of moved beyond it, in the Hmong families, many right here in the cities, where there was there was hostile rebellion from young Hmong kids about their parents, and as much as they saw to their parents as cultural values in terms of parenting. All right, you could probably add your list. I'll just go over mine. And um, in the parenting class that I would do, we, we, we put, I put these out on the front end. I don't have a little part about the master's weekend up there, but I've got, I take that out. But the rest of it is um, very much, and in, in I, uh, they're gonna do some reading. They're gonna read, um, for those who are really invested, they'll read Children the Challenge, and many will. Um, some parents don't read anything, they don't want to, so they just sort of take away what you can give them verbally, plus handouts, and I'll give you some samples this morning. Um, other parents will kind of walk the line. If you give them something nice and simple, they'll read it, but they're not gonna read a book. Um, so, we go through these ideas, and we keep trying to bring them back, bring them back, bring them back, in the course of training the parent. The objective of your parenting is to prepare your child for responsible, and independent social living. Many very needy parents try to hold on to their kids because their kids satisfy their emotional needs or they try to get them to. Um, so I want the parents to think about their child as sort of getting out of the nest quick. Um, that will be the greater gift. Most times as a parent, you get from your child what you behave for. So um, they like to sort of tell me that they respond to their children that the reason they get tough with them is because they have to. Um, well, if you look at it a little more systemically, um, as a parent, most times I think you get what you behave for. So if you have a highly rebellious, resistant child, um, good chance that something in your parenting is promoting that, or maybe even provoking it. You cannot make a child do anything, but you can win your child's cooperation. One of the, the mes messages out of Dreykers' work was, that's really what parents do best the best parents, I should say, the most effective parents, is they win their child's cooperation because this is what they get when they don't do that. 
So they can't make children do anything. I guess you can slap them and for one or two minutes they'll do what you slapped them for. Maybe. I never did. Um, as much as possible, do not do for your child what he or she can do for himself or herself. So as this training for independent social living occurs, um, we have to be careful to allow children to learn and grow away. Your child needs encouragement like a plant needs water. The best parents are the best encouragers. There's one gift you can give your child every day when you get out of bed in the morning. It's to encourage your child. The wick of social interest lies within your child, and you must light it. This is the part, I think, that gets missed in the modern American family moving at 80 miles an hour, is that parents may not spend the time they need to to light the, 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 the wick of social interest. I don't use the word social interest in my handout that I use when I do the cornerstones of parenting uh, with parents. I talk about community feeling or social service or something. <coughs> social interest, unexplained, is a term that will, a lot of parents who have never heard this kind of material before don't quite understand. Viol against, violence against your child encourages your child to be violent. Uh, one, of these, one of the topics that you really dance around in running these parent ed groups is spanking. All of a sudden, you'll get a hand that goes up. Do you, what do you think of spanking? Oh gosh, when I hear that, I, because there'll be some parents in there who will be spanking a lot. There's some who are vehemently against it. It'll divide the group if you let it come out too much as a, a point of conversation. So I sort of dance around it. Um, but the, the, the non-spankers will get really down on spankers, and they'll start lecturing them, parent to parent, in the group. You know, so that that part of the conversation has to be handled delicately. Uh, train your child using consequences. Um, you cannot force your child to do anything, but you can gain your child's cooperation and a sense of social responsibility through the use of consequences. Of course, that for us is what I call a no-brainer. You are not responsible for your child's behavior, but you are responsible for your behavior toward your child. Uh, this is something that, um, you know, I, I think trips a lot of parents up. They get out in places where their child will act out, and they suddenly feel a tremendous responsibility to tame their child, to quiet their ch child, to or remove their child, you know. And um, so, uh, are we really responsible for the behavior of our children? Probably not. We are responsible, however, for how we behave toward our children. And finally, have you ever heard this before? To live life to the fullest and realize our greatest human potential, we must develop the courage to be imperfect. Parenting is a very imperfect process. There isn't anybody who's got it right. Um, and so you figure it out together. And one thing I do in the parent ed groups that I run is the first night I get them all to <laughs> fill out a, a, a sheet that, con that I use as a contact sheet. When they get back to the second session, I hand that out and I, I get them to kind of meet each other. And I say, you know, when you're having a rough time with your son or daughter, you probably don't need to call the therapist like me. You don't have to call me. Call one another. <coughs> You, you're developing a common language. You're developing a common way of viewing the parenting experience, how you will behave. Coach each other. And so if you can really get the parents to think of it's OK to call on a friend or call on somebody from one of these parenting groups who understands these terms, it's a gift. And they do it. Some do it. Some are still reluctant. They try to do it by themselves. They, they feel like they should, like they should be able to do this you know, without help. And it's an overwhelming process. Um, so the more they can be in contact with each other, so let's listen to a second voice. I think he said that punishment in a democratic society is useless. It seems to me that punishment, uh, while I admit that it does not support learning, nevertheless <coughs> does have the capacity to inhibit activity, and sometimes it's quite useful to inhibit activity. The said parish, it does not inhibit. All our criminal laws, the death penalty and so on, all the threat of punishment does not stop people from misbehaving. It becomes inadequate as a stimulation. We will find that anybody who at the point of the gun makes something doing will not enjoy his uh, success very long. We find better ways to stimulate participation and fulfillment and punishment. And empirically, you find it in our schools, in our homes. It just doesn't work anymore. And anybody who believes that he can through punishment and threat of punishment to do people from, to uh, stop them from doing wrong is simply a mistake. He doesn't know. The acts of punishment increase with the acts of violation. We have better ways to get consensus, participation, 
then punishment. And these are the ways which we try to teach. Another question? Dr. Dreikers, uh, would you explain the subtle differences then between punishment and uh, logical consequences, which you've suggested as a technique for coping with problems? Uh, you see, in this class, we will try, after we have eliminated general consideration, to work with concrete approaches. Now, logical consequence is one of the most powerful and necessary means. Right. You see, it's not as we are speaking against punishment, the futility of punishment, we are always accused of being permissive. And most people don't see any other alternative. Either punishment or permissiveness. And we find that we have stronger methods to influence people, as particular children, to conform to the needs of the situation. The authority of the adult is gone for good. You can't make a child or stop a child, for example. But the adults can learn to use reality, the demands of reality, to affect the child much more than any power of the individual can. Now, the adults find it very difficult to distinguish because as soon as you stop him from doing something, you are already punishing him. If you let him experience an unpleasant consequence, to his punishment. That's not true. It has been done in such a way that the child realized that is a situation. And there is a subtle difference. Punishment is retaliation for what you have done. As you will need, need when we discuss more in detail logical consequences. Logical consequences set what happens as long as you want to do it. And there is a subtle difference which makes it so difficult for adults to understand the difference. For children, it is unbelievable how they respond differently. But you are quite right. The distinction is difficult to make for adults for whom any unpleasant consequences function. How many of you have never, had, you have never seen him before? I had a feeling there'd be some number of you who had never heard his voice, or how many? How many of you had never seen Adler speak before? Oh, quite a few have never seen Adler speak. Okay. Uh, let me run you to the uh, year 2007, well, actually 2006. <coughs> and there's a new voice here who's doing some wonderful work. Oh. Um, something I use a lot. I'm gonna, I have some inventories that I'll give you when we finish up at 10:15 that you can take, for example, um, this, this uh, website, which then is a kind of a plethora of all kinds of uh, available materials on parenting. It's called Active Parenting Publishers, uh, maintained out of Marietta, Georgia by a um, psychologist who's really devoted his life now to working with parents and parent education called Michael Popkin. I'm gonna show you him in just a moment. Uh, Popkin has really uh, expanded this. I think it's now in four or five languages. Uh, there are a number of inventories. In fact, some of the inventories now are up online um, so that the parent can actually sit there and do them. Um, trying to dis what, what, what's very important in the initial stages of uh, working with parents, I think, is to have them understand what their current parenting style is. And I have an inventory that will help you do that. Some of you taken who have been in my classes, but um, I, I spend the initial part of my parent education classes having them think about how are they behaving towards their children? What is their parenting style? Um, let me show you Popkin first, and then I'll go into that for just a bit. Um, I have to flip this over to... Uh, what was this, is, this is Michael Popkin. Excuse me, what was his book's name again? Oh, he's Minnie. Um, Minnie. It's all under the banner of Active Parenting. Yeah. Okay. Please, play. <laughs> My privilege to introduce you to the author and founder of Active Parenting, Dr. Michael Popkin. Popkin. It was Dr. Popkin's vision of using video to enhance parent education that led to the first active parenting program in 1983. Since that time, millions of parents have completed this award-winning program and found that they made a positive impact in their lives and the lives of their children. Dr. Popkin has traveled throughout the world talking to parents and educators about the importance of parenting education and has appeared on CNN and over 200 television shows, including Oprah. Oh, and like you and me, he's also a parent. Dr. Michael Popkin. Hello, and welcome to Active Parenting Now. Your commitment of time and energy in being here says volumes about how seriously you take the job of parenting, and for that I congratulate you. As I talk to groups of parents and professionals, I always point out that parenting is both important and difficult. 
important to the future of our society, and difficult in that today's complex world creates many problems that didn't exist in generations past. And like any job that's both important and difficult, it deserves training and support. Now, thanks to organizations and individuals like the ones making your program possible, we're making parent education available to more and more parents. So, have a great time, and I look forward to joining you again later. So, here we begin. A six-session course called Active Parenting Now, designed to help you do the most important job in your life for the most important people in your life, your family. Active Parenting, the most important job in my life. She asked for more handouts. I'm not sure. I, what I, I'm trying to put out to you is, um, I can be, I'll make more of these. Uh, we can get more made. The, um, the handout that I just gave you is um, a view of the different parenting styles and how children respond to those. Um, and it's an interesting chart when you look at it, but this is based on a uh, template that's done by a, um, and Larry and out and Liz out now in Washington State, Henry Stein. But he did a nice job of sort of saying, well, you know, when you take the variations on the styles of parenting, uh, what do they look like in operation, and then how do children respond to these many times? Uh, this handout is, I've done a few workshops for like teachers, you know, and they, they, they like this because it, for them, they sort of work from the right-hand column across the page. And if you have a child who's acting in a certain way many times in a classroom, you can maybe extract by watching the behavior, how might that child be parented at home? And then as a teacher, how might I work with that child not to counter the parents, but in some ways supplement what they're doing. The theory about the parenting um, of children, as some of you may know, and what, we're, what you're trying to work towards is something like this. Adler himself said that we, when it comes to actively parenting children, um, or not, the two great mistakes can be, what? Neglecting a child or can't bring a child, right? And by neglect, of course, I think he meant um, not taking care, not not sort of abandoning the child. You, you're not taking care of the child's needs. You're um, you're not attending to the child in any way. Pampering is of a different kind, and there are various ways to pamper a child. If you took this, it would look something like this. We have over here parents who are neglecting. And then we have child uh, parents who are pampering. Now pampering, in, in, in the, um, I think the Adlerian view today, it really comes out as one of two behaviors on a continuum. And the continuum would look like this. Now, if we fast forward to Michael Popkin's language, and I have an inventory that I'll give you, you can go home tonight and find your parenting style. But what it's going to do, it's going to try to tease out where you sit on this continuum. Assuming you're not here, when you run a parent education class, you're not getting these parents, I can clue you. They're not going to be in the room with you. What you're going to get are many parents who might be in that category, but not in this category so much. So you have this continuum. Um, for the sake of argument, over on this side, we have what Michael Popkins calls autocratic parents. Autocratic. When I say autocratic, what, do you, what jumps into your head? And sometimes it's called the domineering and controlling parent. What do these parents do when you watch a domineering and controlling parent or an autocratic parent? What are you seeing many times? Hovering. Hovering. You might see hovering, okay? Criticism. Criticism. Pardon? They're always right, I heard somebody say. Yeah. Many times it's sort of like, like it's my way or the highway. Don't argue with me. On this side of this continuum, you have what, um, it's a variation on the theme. Hopkins is going to call it permissive parents. What, when I say permissive parenting, what do you think of? What jumps into your mind? No limits. No limits. You don't listen to me anyway, so why bother? Why bother? Overindulgence. Overindulgence. So when you look at the, the Stein handout that I gave you that has these classifications, these little blocks, many of those are variations on the theme. See a line from here. And so these actually are both styles of uh, pampering a child. They can be construed as such. 
When a parent is constantly thinking for the child, taking from the child the ability to make his or her decisions, you're sort of robbing the child of self-regulation. When indulging a child, overly indulging a child, the child doesn't build the infrastructure towards resilience. There are some that would believe, and I don't know whether this is really true, that of the two types of parents to have, choose this one. Because there may be some evidence that this, the children that come out of this kind of a family or that kind of a style might be more prone to higher levels of, levels of anxiety and possibly along with that depression. That um, this child without structure and regulation develops a more anxious approach to life. It may be more demanding too, but it may be more anxious. Um, so this might be the greater mistake, believe it or not, of the two along this continuum. So what one is trying to do in these current ed classes, and it's, you don't want to put it up as a as sort of a center there, it's not quite like that, but you almost want to get them as parents to think about parenting parent differently, parenting differently, and Pop is going to call this authoritative parenting. I probably didn't spell it correctly. Authoritative parenting, that's the approach, democratic and encouraging, and if you look at the first block of your sheet there, that is what the um, active parenting initiative is really all about, and really what I think is now today the extension of 1960, 1965 in terms of Children the Challenge, the thrust that was trying to be made there. Now, it all fits within the same large um, orbit. Here is, now you, this is what you can take home tonight. I'll start passing these around. We're about, we're about done. We have a little, little bit of time for conversation, which I wanted, five minutes at least. For those of you who have never taken it, this is the parenting inventory. I'll be doing this, if your ears are burning, Monday night, two weeks from. I'll be with a group of about 20 parents over River Falls, and they'll start the class after a little bit of explanation. By taking this, now the one thing I don't do is give them the score sheet during our first meeting because they will stop listening and they, they can't wait to find out what kind of parent they are. So they immediately start um, scoring themselves. I'm not worried about that now, we're at the end of the hour for you. Here's the scoring template and you have to be a little careful when you're translating your scores. I'll start from around here. Some of you have done this before, but what you'll find by doing this inventory, and this is, this is the inventory for parents of younger children is where on this do you sit? Where on this uh, continuum? Do you lean more towards an autocratic style? Or do you lean more towards a permissive style? Or might your dominant style be that of the democratic and encouraging parent, or what would be called the authoritative parent? Um, let me see, I have it up here. Here's the explanation sheet on what you've scored yourself. Once you've done your scoring, you can... Um, Is there any more of the original questionnaire? They're coming. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I didn't want to pass all this paper out in the beginning because it's all, all sitting all over the chair. I didn't know if I mean, people were coming either. We'll make extras for those who would like them. Um, the last thing I will say, and then we'll um, close up so you can have some conversation. I won't, you know, we got too much paper going around right now. I don't want to pass it out. But I do have some handouts up here of what I use about the, the final, se final sequence in these parent classes about implementing training of children through the use of consequences as opposed to punishment and reward. That's a hard leap for a lot of parents to make. They, they do many times come in thinking that the way you train a child is to punish the child. The more you punish, the more you get a lot of those variables that you identified are up here under that timeline. So the theory in this line of parenting, as you well know, is you're constantly working to help the child cooperate with the family, and you do that through the use of consequences, a very um, sort of time-proven method. Now, where we go from here, who knows? You know, in a hundred years, what are we going to be talking about in terms of raising children? It's hard to tell. I think what Adler and Dreikers had in mind, that this was going to be a long, it took a long time to get to where we are today. How many thousands of years? So this change, you know, we're sort of maybe even still on the front end of it. I was, there's, a, there's one kind of videotape that um, we have here of Dreikers talking to a group, and he talks about the changing nature of the family and how he can he, as he sees the family becoming a different kind of social unit. And he talks about new forms of union, new forms of marriage, you know. So not only are we going to have a family, and it's already happening, of course, we know that, 
the family as a, as a unit defined is changing rapidly, as are the methods of parenting. So it's a very complex equation with a lot of movement on both sides. The family's not the same as it was 100 years ago, nor a parenting method. So as we fit these two together over the next 50 or 100 years, it's going to be very interesting to watch how this comes out. So comments, and then we'll close. Anything? OK, I'll just take you one at a time. Speak up so everybody can hear you. Joy. One of the things I was thinking about was a sense of somebody is that um, when you're speaking about how they, they children, they don't want it, they, they're basically rebellious. I was thinking of that what I was hearing is that the children saying, I am somebody. And I think that when uh, years back before this whole industrial revolution, when the children were actually participating in family life more by doing things where they were able to see the example and model, they were being more treated like, um, kind of like responsible little people. And I think that's maybe why there was more cooperation. That's a wonderful point. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a wonderful point. And how it's, that it's moving, it's like if you're talking to me like I'm an object, I am a somebody. And I, and I think that, and that's part of what I'm seeing. I think that, because in raising my child, when I moved to this person, yeah. They're, they're just small steps, but they're a person. And I approached, I had much more success than when I moved to being more, you know, the object, you know, and, you know, not that I really thought object, but you know what I mean? You're yes. really getting to that place as a person. Yeah. Just do it. I don't have time. That's when the problem is. I thought there were more problems. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Yeah. The way I, I sometimes express that point that I'm going to build on for you guys, um, if we're so busy entertaining our children in today's society, we forget to need them. You know, give them a purpose in life. Everybody, the deepest human need is to be needed. So thank you for sparking that. Of course, one of the themes of Children the Challenge is to get children to work in the home early. To feel that sense of contribution. It's a major theme of the book. Deborah. Could you just give me give us a quick outline of how you run these parenting courses, like week one, week two, you know, then once they get this and they all look at it and go, oh my gosh, I need to change this. Like, is it support type thing? Do you start with discussion and then small groups? I, I move a lot to case studies. Um, the first section is kind of teaching. The first third, probably the middle third, is a lot of case studies. And then very carefully, because you can get in the group either A, a very needy parent, a very talkative parent, allowing them to bring to the group for case study a situation from their own parenting. Much the idea of open form family counseling in the Adlerian model, that you bring to the group for a discussion a, fa a family problem. You know, But I have to kind of get to know the tempo of the group before I do that, because <coughs> if, I, if I think too early about who that might be, I might end up by mistake, picking a parent that's going to become identified as too talkative, too busy, <coughs> and people kind of stop listening to those people, you know. So um, I manage that very carefully. In fact, I, I pre-screen the case studies. I say when we get to the